Well, as the year gets underway properly, uh, we begin to think increasingly of the election that is due this year, usually in April or May by a tradition in South Africa. Now, according to Cities economist Gina Skumon, if the ANC gets less than 60% uh, majority vote in those uh, upcoming national and provincial elections, there could be a populist backlash. Those were her words. She joins us now to explain that comment. Hi, Gina. Hi, uh, that was the comment that caught my eye, and I thought, well, how does she know that, and what's the difference between 60 and 59? I would think if they lost 10 percentage points, obviously that would be dramatic. I think what people are forgetting also is that the, the national and provincial elections in 2009, they were at 65, 66. Mm. But the municipal elections in 2011, they dropped to around 63. So that must be the most recent benchmark. But why this backlash if it's just below 60? Well, look, I must admit, 60% is just a psychological level. Mm -hmm. And there's no reason to say that you would have a governing body that worked differently if they were 59% or 61%. Oh. Um, the reason why we think the 60% is important is simply from a psychological mm. perspective. I still think if the ANC has to even get 60 or 63% versus the previous elections where they had 65.9, you would also get a sense of urgency mm. that more needs to, needed to be done. But the populist backlash that we are guarding against, so we are just cautioning and flagging as a red flag for our investors, is that you know, you do need to appease the masses and keep your voters on your side. Yeah. I mean, let me play devil's advocate here for two seconds. I mean, w w the, 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 the tail end of the article talked, you know, linked uh, this uh, psychological 60% to possible uh, rating downgrades and the like. Would you not perhaps, if you took a different angle to it, say that if, this, if the ANC was to come down, whether it's 63 or 59, that this could actually be a reflection of a strengthening of democracy in South Africa, where you have a stronger mm. opposition that is really able to keep the ruling party uh, in check? No, absolutely. Um, I mean, to, to just put it on the table, what, what we were suggesting is that just below 60% or round about there, so, so let me rather say a significant fallback mm. from where the ANC was in the previous elections of 65.9%. If you had to move around the 60% mark, we think it does inject a certain amount of urgency, yeah. but not necessarily a bad populist backlash right. as if they had to move to something around 55%, and I know the latest Ipsos survey said that voting support for the ANC was 53%, mm. we don't think they'll get anywhere as low down as that. But if that was the case, hypothetically speaking, that's when we would start to get more concerned that mm. there would have to be an immediate knee-jerk reaction mm. from the ANC to start appeasing the masses. Because remember, after the national elections, I know it's a five-year term, but then the municipal elections will be hot on mm. the press in 2016. Mm. One of the problems is there's always an election. It's yeah. either the municipal elections or the national and provincial or the ANC's own elective conference. Mm. So there's always an election to think about for them. And it's, it's a, I think it's a sad coincidence that they didn't get their own conference aligned with the national election mm. so that you could have a new leadership that goes into an election. Mm -hmm. But the other thing which I think is underestimated with those percentages is for the ANC to come down, the opposition must come up, the combined mm. opposition. Absolutely. And if it was, say, 59, anything below 60, which is not impossible and maybe some would say possible and maybe mm. likely. More likely than before. Okay, certainly, and it wasn't thinkable before. Mm. And now it becomes thinkable. But what does become thinkable if you've got 59? You say, well, that's actually getting close down to 50. Mm. So an opposition victory is no longer unthinkable, but it becomes possible. That, in turn, must change perceptions. Oh, it, it certainly does, and it, it starts to, I, I would say, allow the public to understand that a little bit more credit needs to be given to some of these opposition parties that are actually very new in mm. their formation. Yeah. I mean, I know in the previous election, the big new opposition party was COPE. This time which, round, which we've didn't got cope at all. <laughs> cope at all. <laughs> but this time round, we don't just have one newcomer, we've got two. Both yeah. the EFF and Khang, which everyone, if you watch social media, is watching very, very closely. Um, but one other thing I just want to add is that we keep talking about the national elections. So we must remember also the provinces, mm -hmm. right? It's one thing for the ANC to still have, you know, major majority rule, but let's say above 60 percent on a national level. Mm -hmm. But that's not to say that they will still enjoy the majority rule across the majority mm. of provinces. And I think heading towards municipal elections in 2016, what starts to make this playing field, field a little bit more level is that if we assume the DA retains the Western Cape, what happens to Gauteng? Mm. Because mm. if you've got Gauteng and the Western Cape in your, prof in your pocket, 
suddenly the economic power of this country is in one person's hand and one mm. person's hand only. And that's the interesting bit that I think a lot of the market isn't looking at, mm. which could actually turn the tables a lot more. And we might actually see even more coalitions between parties. We m might even see more stronger opposition parties um, in the lead up to 2016 mm. or, or even beyond that. And look, none of this is easy or I would even say possible to forecast. Mm. Right. Because the first, the starting block for even trying to forecast this would be trying to work out how many people are actually going to vote, mm. right? And then if you convince people to vote, you then have to convince them to vote for you. And then you've got about 1.9 million new voters, the born freeze that we've all heard about, the 18, 19 year olds. So if you've convinced them to vote, which the registration rates aren't very high at the moment, you then have to convince them to vote for you. Mm. Then you've got Kosatu's yeah. tripartite alliance. What's happening there? Let me just jump in for a second. I mean, I think a lot of the conversation that we've had around the desk is based on these surveys that w that we see, and in particular, the Ipsos survey has come out come up a number of times. If we look at how s these surveys have compared to the actual outcome, I mean, they you know s the ANC hitting 65.9, and I think Ipsos had forecasts around 63 percent. They always seem to be slightly below the actual outcome when we talk about the ANC. In particular. Let's talk about the margin of error and I know that you said earlier it was 3%. Comparatively, is that a good number or is that a number that we should be, awa we should be worried about? Well, I think in any forecast there's always a margin of error. And Epsos has come out to say, to say these are just the survey results. Please don't take them as an indication for what will actually happen in the election. And that is guarding because it is so difficult to forecast, particularly a, a democracy, an emerging market like South Africa. Mm -hmm. This is a, a lot more difficult than a developed market, yeah. right, you where margins of error are smaller. You also want to know how many rural people did they speak to? Mm. How many people who do not have telephones did they speak to? Although most people now do have Mobile. a cell phone. Mm -hmm. So you have, you have to ask questions mm. about the methodology. But I suppose if it's like on like, then it gives some kind of guide. It's, it's a good indication of trend if you look at their previous yeah. results versus the actual outcome. And what I will flag, and Epsos has, has um, mentioned this before, their next survey, an updated survey, is coming out in March. Mm -hmm. Now that one will certainly, because it's more current and so immediately before the elections, that one will certainly be the one to watch. Because even though November seems like just the other day, I think a lot has happened in this country ever since then. Mm. So I think the results of that survey will actually be very important to watch. And not just who they say people are willing to support, but who is willing to vote. Mm. Actually vote. Yeah, L looking also at uh, a party that's been in power nationally for 20 years. Uh, that's, that's a long time in a democracy. Uh, and traditionally, in the democracies on which we are modelled, uh, there's an alternation. Even if one mm. power stays quite long, there's an alternation. So you've actually got a party that's not accustomed to the idea of not being in office. What do you effect do you think that ch changed perception is going to have on the way they react? Well, what we hope for, and this is the, the good news outcome, mm. is that you know, if the ANC had to lose a certain degree of, of support in this election, um, perhaps keeping around that 60% area again, they still guaranteed majority. But of course, they know that hot on their footsteps is, is, is the opposition. What we hope for then is better service delivery. Right. I think as a first step, if we got that, mm. I think the public perception of the leadership within the ANC mm -hmm. would immediately jump and, and improve. Very quickly, Jean, at you know, th we heard news this morning that uh, you know uh, Mampela Rampela could uh, be moving over to the DA, and of course this might mean uh, the end of Akhang and change the landscape a, a little bit. There are forecasts that EFF uh, might get between seven and ten percent. Some people have been very optimistic, hiking it right up to twenty percent, which I, I also think is slightly over the top. But very quickly, if you look at the landscape now, how important is it to investors uh, when you share the, 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 the political picture of South Africa? How many uh, you know, political parties are on the ground, the, the strength of their opposition or the strength of their muscle against the ruling party? And does 60% psychologically make a difference to investors or not? I think psychologically it does. Uh, below 60% immediately will flag to investors that they need to keep a, a much stronger watch on the opposition to see who could then start to be the thorn in the ANC side, which I think is then the other aspects of this. When it comes to offshore investors, when it comes to the national elections, the one question we get asked repeatedly is how much chance does the EFF actually have in they will get a couple of seats in Parliament, no doubt. You need 40,000 votes for one seat in Parliament. But 
are they actually something to watch in the much longer run mm. for South Africa? Because I think a lot of investors were told previously that Julius Malema, when he was um, asked to leave the ANC Youth League, that you know he was. A lot of people said he would go away, but someone uh, with that type of leadership. And he certainly has it. You know, he can grab a soapbox, stand up anywhere, and he will get a lot of people supporting him. Now, someone like that typically doesn't go away, mm. which is why I think we've seen him reemerge mm. in the EFF. And it's because of his radical language in previous, from nationalization of, of mines to banks and, and the service delivery protests that I think he's able to mobilize mm. in order to make the ANC look bad. That is what investors are watching very closely.